is the InnovaBuzz podcast, helping smart businesses be even more innovative. Hi, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Welcome to episode number 70 of the InnovaBuzz podcast, designed to help smart businesses with an interest in innovation become even more innovative. In this episode, my guest is Alastair McGill of Ashton McGill, who helps businesses thrive by addressing their strategies, their growth, and their innovation. Ali is very passionate about the topic of customer experience and designing products or services or systems for the customer. And he states that the way you do this, the way you make the customer the center of all you do in a business, is innovation. I'm sure you'll enjoy listening to Ali, so without further ado, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Ali McGill. Hi, I'm Jürgen Strauss from Innova Biz, and I'm really excited to have with me today on this episode of the Innova Buzz podcast, all the way from the other side of the world today, from Dundee in Scotland, Ali McGill, who's the founder and co-director of Ashton McGill. Now, Ashton McGill Health businesses thrive by helping with their strategies, their growth and their innovation. All of this done through the focus of customer experience. So welcome to the podcast, Ali. Thanks, Jürgen. It's wonderful to be here. Yeah, it's a privilege to have you here. Now, as well as running Ashton McGill, Ali is also an entrepreneur in residence at the University of Dundee, an in-demand speaker, and he regularly presents at events and conferences around Europe. Now, I noticed you're also a co-organiser, or you have been co-organiser of TEDx Dundee. Yeah, we've run TEDx here in the city the last couple of years, and uh, it's the first time it's been done in, in the city, and it's just gone phenomenally well. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've had uh, a few here, probably about three, the last three years here in Melbourne, which, um, you know, they're awesome events. Yeah, it's just a wonderful day of learning. And I come away from a TEDx event just with my head almost exploding with ideas and yeah. inspiration. Yeah, that's right. All right. So now Chris Ma from the Content Marketing Academy suggested we interview you on the podcast. So big hello to Chris and thank you for the introduction. He's a um, good guy, Mr. Mar. I've, um, <laughs> yeah. I've had the pleasure, pleasure of knowing him for several years now and uh, just a really a genuine, honest, authentic and inspiring young man. Yeah, yeah, he is good. I've been following him since our podcast interview and he does put out some really good stuff and the Content Marketing Academy is really great value too. Yeah, yeah. Now, I've been a member of, sorry. Oh, sorry, yeah. I, I was going to say, I've been a member of Chris's community for about 18 months now and I've known him for a long time but I've been a member of the content marketing academy um, for yeah about 18 months and and what he's doing there is really interesting the dynamic that has been created within a group of people is something I've never seen before so Mm. um, really innovative approach to to building communities yeah yeah, that's that's quite amazing. I'm involved in a couple of communities. And actually, if we have time, I'll tell you a story about what happened over the weekend with our community that I'm involved in. But that's pretty inspiring when you can get uh, a community together around a shared interest like that and then, um, you know, build that uh, sense of camaraderie and also sense of shared learning and sense of support for one another. Yeah, it's definitely something special. Mm. Now, as I was doing my research into you, I found out that you're also a keen competitive cyclist and also into mind mapping. So we've got lots in common to talk about. <laughs> we Fantastic. might end up needing uh, several episodes. <laughs> Great. I look forward to that. Yeah. All right. So uh, before we start talking about Ashton McGill and customer experience and innovation and all kinds of things like that, let's find out a little bit more about your background. So what did you want to do when you were a young kid? Did you always have ambitions to start your own business? Do you know, it's, it's funny, you mentioned the competitive cycling thing. And if I'm honest, when I was a young kid, what I wanted to do was do sport for a living. <laughs> and in those days, I played golf. I was a decent golfer. Okay. Um, but I was one of these kids who had to work really hard to be good. Yeah. Whereas my, young, my younger brother, who did become a golf professional, um, had all the talent and, and none of the dedication. <laughs> it, it came naturally to him. He didn't have to work at it. He didn't have to practice to play well. He could just go out and, and, and put phenomenally good scores together, whereas I had to work really hard to be, to be you know, average at that level. And, <laughs> um, 
so that was really what I wanted to do. And I guess I realized as I got a little older that I wasn't going to make a, a living from being a, a golfer um, or any other sport come to that. So um, you get that realization around your mid-teens, I suppose. Yeah. And I didn't really, you know, but this was back in the 80s, Jürgen, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. And if I'm honest, I'm still exploding. <laughs> and, <laughs> but I was good with numbers and I was interested in economics and how the world worked from a financial and an economic standpoint. So that led me into the world of accounting. I never, I, I never wanted to be an accountant per se. I trained as an accountant. I studied and qualified with a, a firm who were called Ernst & Young at the time, now called EY one of the mm. biggest in the world. And that was a great learning ground for me. Uh, and I had the opportunity to learn from some, some super mentors and to get that professional qualification. But a life of crunching numbers wasn't what I had foreseen for myself. I, as I, said, I didn't really know what it was, but I figured that if I understood the numbers and had a good grasp of the business side of things, that would stand me in good stead. Hmm. So what, what were some of the key milestones then on your journey through where you were at EY to where you are today? I, I spent a lot of my time at EY doing what we now call corporate finance. So I was helping businesses to raise funds. I was helping them to grow and I was helping them with their strategy. And I, I, I decided to leave EY when an opportunity came up to join a client and it, the reason I did that was that I was spending all this time advising and none of this time doing. I was really interested. <laughs> yeah. To see, yeah, I was really interested to see what happened day to day. So, hmm. you know, we help a business raise money and then we step back and then we go and help another business raise money and then we step back. I wanted to be on the other side and to experience what it meant to run a business. And I, and I got an opportunity to join a client in 1992, which I decided to take. And I didn't really think a great deal about it. It just felt like the right thing to do. I've made a lot of decisions in my life based on gut feel. Mm. And, and off I went. And over the next 10 years, we turned what was a construction business into a group of companies. And that was really where I cut my entrepreneurial teeth. I became the MD of that group within two or three years. And by the time I left 10 years later, we had interests in leisure, we had interest in um, food manufacture. We owned a chain of snooker clubs. The, the chairman was a really entrepreneurial guy. And um, you know, we just had a, a huge amount of fun. We bought businesses. We sold businesses. We had successes. And we had failures. And, and I learned what it's like at that time to have a business where we had to put it into, into liquidation. Um, so, you know, I went through all those different business emotions in 10 years. And, and it was a heck of a, a, heck of a journey. Um, I then went into a period that I call my wilderness years of, of the sort of early 2000s where I'd come out of that business, I'd sold, the, I'd sold a business, put a bit of money in the bank, and I just wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I landed up in Aberdeen, which is the oil and gas capital here in Europe. And, um, and that was, we lived there for 10 years, Jürgen. We moved there in 2003. And uh, I had a really interesting time up there. I ran a couple of businesses um, one of which I'd set up myself, another I was headhunted into. And uh, that was when I came across what I do now. So in terms of a milestone around about 2009, I've always had a creativity. Uh, my daughter's a designer, my son's a designer, and uh, I've always had this kind of creativity, creativity lurking in the balance, but the, the accounting training knocks that out of you. <laughs> and um, <laughs> But every business I've run, every business I've built has, has been about the customer. So I've used the language, I used to use the language of being customer centric. And I, I figured that if we build our business around solving customers' needs and problems, then, then that must be a good way to do things. Um, and then in 2009, I think it was, I came across this term service design. I was working on a project with the company I, I owned at the time. We were, we were um, working with the local university and, and they, they introduced us to a department that they had which did service design. I'd never heard of service design. I, by this point, I kind of understood what design was beyond just the visual stuff. Hmm. But, but I worked on this project with their department, and, I, and, and it just opened my eyes to a whole new way of doing things. It gave me, it kind of codified all the stuff I'd done throughout my life on gut feel. Um, but it put the user front and center in everything that you did. And, you, and I learned 
the methodologies that sit behind service design and how to design services that people will want to use and want to engage with. And that was a really transformational point in my life. The next big milestone in this journey was 2011. My daughter had gone to study at the university where I'm now entrepreneur in residence. And um, she went there to study design. And she came home, um, I guess, at some point early in her second year and said, I've met this, this guy, you need to meet him. His name's Professor Mike Press. And he's talking about service design. And that's what he does. He's, he's, you know, he's one of the world leading thinkers and experts in service design. And then I met Mike and, and that took me on another journey, which has led me to this point where I am today. So it's an interesting journey and an interesting transition from being an accountant, you know, 20 plus years ago to now I spend my life working as a designer, which is almost the other end of the spectrum. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that, that's a fascinating journey. Um, and, and I noticed that one of your favorite questions is actually one of my favorite questions, which I normally ask at about this point in time. And that's why do you do what you do? Yeah, yeah, I love to ask that question. I don't like to be asked it so much. <laughs> um, so for me, it comes back to helping people. And, and I maybe didn't think this way 15 years ago or 20 years ago, you know, just put the customer front and center. But, but I didn't really, there wasn't a why, there wasn't a deep rooted purpose and core to that. It just felt like the right thing to do. And as I've got older, that's become clearer to me. And, and why I do what I do is that I, I strongly believe that, that, that experiences, services can be better and that as, as humankind, we can be nicer to each other. And I, a lot of the work I'm doing just now is around empathy. Mm. And I, I, I was speaking at two events last week, actually, on, on the subject of empathy. And I think that in this world that we live in where it's instant gratification and you know, people are sitting on staring at their mobile phones rather than talking to one another. <laughs> and yeah, um, uh, that I think we need to bring more of that back into our lives. So, and I have not found a way yet of crystallizing that into a, a thirty-second or a sixty-second pitch. If you like, why do I do what I do? But it, but it's about reconnecting humans and mm. and just bringing back that empathy that we have, what we all have within us. We all have the capability within us. It's just that for many of us, it's locked away somewhere. Yeah, yeah, we kind of struggle with that, don't we? And yeah. it's it's funny you mentioned you know we kind of have our faces buried in our mobile phones, and <laughs> and I was chatting with uh, a young man from London who actually developed an app um, to connect people, and so this is a yeah. young fellow who's well into the um, technological space, but he, he issued a challenge on our podcast to um, actually connect to people and speak to strangers. And one of the things that I found was um, if you speak up in an elevator where people normally get in and <laughs> stare at the wall or the ceiling, if you actually speak up and talk to people, everybody suddenly opens up and starts having a conversation. Yeah. It's quite funny, isn't it? It's fascinating. Hmm. We were... It it was um, Mothering Sunday here in the UK yesterday, and uh, my daughter was back from London. She now lives and works as a designer in London, and she was home for the weekend, and, and we went out for lunch yesterday in Edinburgh. And, uh, and we sat, and the three of us sat, my, my wife, my daughter, and I sat having a lovely lunch and, and just conversing and enjoying each other's company. And a young family came in and sat at the table next to us, mother, father, and three children. And within a couple of minutes of them sitting down, mum and dad were sitting, staring at their phones. The kids had been, <laughs> yeah, I don't, you, know, you know, when the, you take children into a restaurant, often they're given sheets of paper and colouring pens. Yeah, yeah. And then that's, that's how the restaurant looks after children. Um, so the kids had been given their pens and they're busy starting to colour stuff in. And mum and dad, instead of talking to each other or encouraging the kids, are now, I don't know what they were doing, scrolling through Facebook or Twitter mm. or, or whatever it was. And I thought, blimey, you know, what's happening to us? But we yeah. can't, as a family, go in and sit and have a Sunday lunch together. Now, that might, they might just have been a one-off, but I'd, I'd rather suspect they're not as a family. Mm. Yeah, it's sad <laughs> in some ways, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and it, you know, it's one of the things about what I do for a living, that, that I'm trained to observe um, and watch people, and that, that's a big part of what we do in our, in our work, is to observe and, and then use that to make things better. And so I can't help but notice these things. I, I, it's like my, these senses are turned way up in my head 
So I'm constantly paying attention to what's happening in the world around me. And I see more and more of that now, of people just not talking to each other. Mm. Yeah, which, um, so I've got some questions around what you do at Alistair McGill, but maybe you can kind of give us a snapshot of what it is that Alistair McGill does and yeah. what you yeah, get involved I mean, in. Sure, yeah. Uh, the, the, broad, the broader sense, you know, we, we talk about helping businesses to thrive, but really what does that mean? Um, what it means is that, that we work with organisations of all sorts, not just commercial organisations. So I spend a chunk of my time still working within a university, and I, that's a passion of mine, teaching and educating. Mm. Um, so I, I, I make time in my life to do that. It's important to me. Um, in our, within our business, we help people to innovate. We help people to think differently about what it is that they do. We help them to understand their customers and users and to understand the market and then to design services based on what the market's needs and problems actually are. Right. One of the things I've found over the years is that people make an awful lot of assumptions. And we do that in life and we do that in business. And, uh, uh, and an awful lot of our businesses and the businesses that are around us have been built based upon assumptions. And we help our clients to, to challenge those assumptions and to make sure that what it is that they do is solving somebody's problem or meeting a need. Uh, and we do that in lots of different ways. We're not a big business, Jürgen, and, and that's on purpose at the moment. I've run businesses with hundreds of people and I'm quite enjoying at the moment having the flexibility and fluidity that being small gives you. Mm. I don't have to answer to anybody else apart from my wife. Um, <laughs> Um, so, you know, if I, if I, if I want to go to London next week to work on a wee project with somebody, then I can. And then that's quite an enjoyable thing. So really, it's the core of what we do is about, about helping people to see the world a bit differently and perhaps change the lens with which they see things. Hmm. That's, that's a fascinating take on, on the whole idea of, you know, having or developing a business based on a service that, people actually need or want or is going yeah. to make a contribution. Yeah. So I, I really like the way you've put that in in all the stuff you publish on the website mm. and, and your blogs, your recent blogs, focus very much on the customer experience. And I noticed you put yeah. one out today about Edinburgh's <laughs> trams. <laughs> I didn't I read did. it yet. Yeah. It's, it just it came was, in um, a few months again, it ago. Was just a it was an observation based on our journey yesterday. And, and one of the things they've done, love, which is lovely in Edinburgh, is they, they built some trams. They, I guess most of our cities used to have trams many, many years ago. And, and um, Edinburgh decided to bring them back about four or five years ago. So they spent a ridiculous amount of money. It was like 10 times over budget. But eventually they got them built. And the, the trams connect the airport to the city centre. So there's... A, the, until they built the trams, Jürgen, there was no other way to travel from Edinburgh Airport to Edinburgh City Centre quickly and mm. conveniently. So there's no railway station, none of that the infrastructure you have in, in modern large cities. So Edinburgh realised that it would be a good thing as Scotland's capital to have that, and so they built the trams. But what they haven't done is think about the user experience. They've built the trams and they've put systems and processes in place that are the systems and processes that work best for the, tri the tram company. <laughs> yeah, not for the user. Yeah. So, one of the, so one of the observations is that if you have landed from the US and a lot of credit cards in the US, I don't know if it's like this in Australia, but they don't have, we have a thing called chip and pin here in the UK. So there's a little computer chip embedded in the card and when you go to pay for something, you don't, you don't have to sign for it. You just put your PIN number mm. in and it connects everything together. Well, that's, that's the system that these, the, the, the ticketing system is based upon. Now, if you're from the US or Japan, you don't have chip and PIN in your card. So the first thing you notice is people trying to buy a ticket with a card that won't work in the won't work, machine. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, if you've just landed and, okay, if you're from Japan, then English isn't your first language. If you're from Germany, it's not your first language. Um, uh, and, uh, and it's really difficult to understand the signage. There's also another sign that says um, tickets must be bought before you get on the tram. And if you don't, then there will be, well, they don't call it a fine, but there's a fine of £10 for not having a valid ticket on the tram. So you can't just get on the tram having landed at the airport, want to get into the city centre. You can't just buy a ticket when you get on the tram. You've got to buy it before you get on. And it's just 
And I watch people get hugely frustrated. They, they're not able to get on the tram because they don't have a ticket or they do get on the tram and they end up being given a fine. And I think if that's your first experience of coming to Scotland, mm. that's not a good one. The other thing that really is frustrating with a ticket machine is that the, the, the um, slot where you have to input your credit card is way down about your knee. Now, <laughs> I'm, about, I'm, I'm, like, I'm like six foot tall. Um, and it's a real struggle for I've got to raise the bend down and put it in. And I've got to kind of hunch my back so I can press the keypad. And all of these things just add up to a really um, poor customer experience, a user experience that not just impacts on that person's ability to travel from A to B, but it's their first experience of coming to our country. Is that welcoming? I don't think so. Is mm. that making it easy? I don't think so. And I watched yesterday as we were going back out, because we there's like a park and ride, and it's, it saves you having to drive into the city centre. There's a park and ride beside the airport. It saves you about £10 in parking, which is a reasonable amount of money to save. So it's, it's on the whole, it's good. It's been well thought out. It's just the detail that they've missed. But this young girl, and I think she was German, had got on at the same stop as us. And then the, the I think they call them travel assistant, had come past asking to see the ticket and the girl said, oh, can I have a ticket? I'm going to the airport. And, and he said, oh, I'm gonna, I can't. You've got to buy a ticket before you get on. Now, in fairness to him, he didn't fine her. But what, what he did do is, is he gave her change. I think she had a five pound note. He gave her five pound coins so that she could get off the tram that she was on at the next stop, buy a ticket, and then wait for the next tram to come along so she could get on that. <laughs> yeah. that that's just crazy. Yeah. It just seems crazy. He obviously has the ability to take a payment because if he wants to charge someone ten pounds as a fine for not having a ticket, he can charge. He them. can do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, it's a little it's, thing. Like that. They happen all around us, and, and it just frustrates me. Yeah, and I mean, there's a couple of things there, isn't there? Because we've we've got a similar thing here in Melbourne. We've got this. Uh, they've brought in this automated ticketing system for all the public transport a few years back, and they've improved it quite a bit recently but it's the same sort of thing it i find it really confusing i've now learned how to use it so it, it's actually quite convenient once you figure it out but uh, <laughs> yeah. the same thing if somebody is coming from international and then suddenly wants to travel around melbourne on public transport which would make a lot of sense particularly in the inner city area uh, they've got to figure out how this works and the main way to get one of these cards is you basically have to buy one and subscribe to it you have to open an account and you have to pay into the account and then it kind of reads yeah. your account and just automatically deducts the fares off of what your account balance is but you know if you're yeah. not a local you there's no reason for you to have an account and there's no easy way to kind of buy a day ticket or mm -hmm. you know a couple of hours ticket or something like that which would seem to me to be a really smart way to yeah. provide a good would, customer experience that would be the logical thing to do the, the london the london transport system has got much better over the last few years they now we have um, contactless payment on our cards here in the uk and which i guess is like apple pay but just so it's just on the card and what they did a few years ago in london maybe two years ago now was allow you and enable the system to allow you to use your contactless card for any journey on any london transport um, a vehicle, whether that's a bus or a, or a train or an underground train. And that, that just has transformed my ability to get around the London. It's so much easier because mm. all I have to do is take my card out. I, I effectively touch my card against the card reader and I get through the barriers and I don't have to buy a ticket. So I arrive in London, I'm rushing to get a train. I just need to, I just need to um, touch my card against the device and then I'm through the barriers. And that has made a huge difference. And actually the system works out in the background how many journeys you've made over the course of a day and applies discounts and all kinds of stuff like that. It's really been well thought out from the user, from the customer's point of view. Mm. Yeah, so there, there's actually a couple of points there, isn't there? There's the system as it's built around, you know, whether it's, focused on the customer and the customer experience. And then there's the culture of the organisation, which comes back yeah. to you know what you mentioned about the ability of the ticket assistant to make yeah. a decision on the spot to make it easy for that tourist. 
exactly yeah yeah so what what are your thoughts on um both of those areas i mean it you know building the yeah. system around customer experience and then in inculcating the culture of the organization to be customer focused yeah i, I find the latter easier to do you can change <laughs> the culture because at the core you know, most human beings want to go to work and do do a good job and mm. enjoy their job and most people don't because the systems don't allow them to do that yeah the culture the culture that's been embedded within an organization doesn't allow them to do that the most fun that we have is when we get to work with a new company a new business or a small team because uh, with a small team you can change things quickly um, i spent 18 months uh, working as head of entrepreneurship at the university of dundee here um, where i'm an entrepreneur in residence and I'd, much of that was enjoyable but the most frustrating thing were the systems and the, the kind of glacial pace of change in a large <laughs> institution like that um, large organizations are, are very difficult to to make a, a, a big impact and it it takes a lot longer to see that um, changing a culture within a large organization like that takes a long time it can be done but but it's it's hard um, and I think I think we, when we run workshops, and, and I was running one last week in, in a place called Newcastle, not too far from here, and uh, we do a little exercise in our workshops where we ask people to talk through experiences they've had recently, good and bad, and, and, and most people now have, they can recount bad experiences quite easily, Jürgen. They really struggle to, mm. to tell you about good experiences, and what I've found in the last year of running these workshops is that for most people, what they what they equate as a good experience now is, is simply when a company has done what they've said they will do. So good is now just meeting our expectations. Yeah, yeah, it's but sad, it, isn't it? It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I think that's a really damning statistic. Mm. Uh, that that that's what we think is good, not when they've gone in the extra mile, but they've actually just done what they've said they'll do. But that that's where the bar is now, and. And a lot of that is because particularly large organizations have systems which are designed around their needs uh, as opposed to just just how uh, just thinking about the person that's going to use your um, services the customer or the user so i mean we could spend all day talking about this um, there are some there are some dreadful examples we've talked about a couple already but both of those things need to change. It's easier to change human behavior than it is to change systems within large organizations. Mm. Yes, I know what you mean by large organizations being slow moving. I've got, uh, <laughs> <laughs> got the same experience here too. And, yeah. and also having worked in a large organization and then moved into my own business where obviously I was the one making yeah. the decisions, it's kind of liberating. <laughs> It really is. And, you know, I understand why why there needs to be decision processes within within these larger organisations. They can't be as dynamic as smaller. There are many more stakeholders. Mm, that's right. But again, it, again, the, 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 these processes and systems can be designed. They can be redesigned. And you know, we purposely use that word design. I'm using it more and more now because it means it's not just about a visual thing. It's conscious thought for me. And so, if you design something, it means to me that you've thought about it. You've actually considered the different people that will engage with that system or service or, or artifact and consciously designed it, consciously built it to be useful. Mm. Yeah, that's, I, I really like that. Um, so one of the things we do when we start off new projects with a new client um, is find out who their target audience is, who their target customer is and you know, that's to me that is so fundamental and yet most businesses struggle to really articulate who is their target customer or target audience and so I think it, it kind of breaks down at that point already and, and then getting into designing the user experience if you like or the customer experience before you actually yeah. design a service or product. Um, yeah if you don't know who your target who your ideal customer is then you know you're on a hiding to nothing. I think it was <laughs> I think it may have been Stanford that published some data at the end of last year. It was one of the big U.S. entrepreneurial universities. They'd looked at, I think, 3,200 startups that had failed. And the purpose of the study was to look at the cause of the failure 
And in the majority, I think it was over 90% of the businesses that failed, the main reason they failed was a lack of product market fit. They designed something that they thought was a good idea that the market didn't because they had made lots of assumptions. And, and unless you go out and talk to real people, real human beings, and understand what their actual needs and problems are, you'd, you'd run a very good risk of just being one of those statistics, one of those failures that didn't quite. And I've been there, I've, I've built a business in the past, a software company with my brother, a golf business, a golf app that we built because we thought it would be a, a great mm -hmm. idea going back several years now, but not enough people in the market uh, agreed with us because we didn't properly go and test it. Yeah, yeah. Of course, that's where the idea of uh, the lean startup um, is yeah. can be useful, you know, to do a minimal viable product or yeah. service and then start to test it with people. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. All right, so... Yeah, um, if, um, we, we talk a lot about, about creating that MVP and you know, one of the other things I think that people... Um, people struggle with is that they, they like to launch a product or service when it's perfect when it's <laughs> yeah. yeah and that can take t tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds or dollars or, or whatever your currency is um, actually we learn more when we push something out and people will criticize Microsoft and have a lot over the years and I'm mm. not I'm a, I'm a Mac user I'm not a huge Microsoft fan um, but what they've done well over the years is release products to get them out to the market and get feedback and then they iterate so they don't push them out when they're perfect they just push them out and when you push products out or services out and 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 are open to feedback and are prepared to listen to what the market thinks that's what we would call rapid prototyping then yeah. you learn you know you learn a huge amount um so uh, i think i was listening to one of your podcasts recently with marcus sheridan and marcus talks about this a lot he i think his language is embrace the messy but just get stuff out Get it out. Don't don't try to be perfect. Listen to your audience. Listen to the customers. Understand what they think about what you've created, and then iterate it. and And that's a much better way. And that is effectively the the lean startup model: build, measure, learn, isn't it? Mm, that's right. But, yeah. Yeah. I think it's a traditional mindset. I think it's a traditional business mindset that that says no. If we want to push something out, it's got to be perfect. It's got to be on brand. Well, yeah, and it's also, well, who says it's perfect until you go talk with the users? <laughs> you know? exactly. uh, so often that ends up in, um, you know, it just gets delayed yeah. for a, a, a long time. And then when it does get to market, even if it does kind of fit the bill, if you like, um, it's, it might be late to market. Well, it's so true, and you've, then you find that you've missed the boat. Someone else has come out with a better product, and uh, the rest is history at that point. That's right, yeah, and there's lots of examples around where um, products first to market, and I think, you know, we, we talked about this when I was back in the corporate world many, many years ago. First to market, first mover advantage is so huge, and there's lots yeah. of examples where, you know, the first in the market still dominates the market share, even though they might not be currently the best product out there. Yeah, uh, you're completely right. There are so many, so many examples of that. Hmm. All right. Now, I noticed you've been doing a lot of video marketing yourself yeah. recently. So talk to us a little yeah. bit about that because it fascinates yeah. me as well. It's, yeah, I guess I've um, part of my career has always been exploring things. Someone, One of my good friends describes me as a, an adventurer or an explorer because I'm always trying new things. <laughs> and... Um, and I ran a business, I mentioned Aberdeen earlier, and I, was, I ran a fairly large business up there um, for a few years. And uh, back in 2011, we started to create video for our business. So we had a YouTube channel, we had a few thousand subscribers, um, and we were, we, were educate, we were doing what we now know as content marketing. Mm. We just didn't know it was called that at yeah. the time. We were answering people's questions with video. And, uh, and it was really good for our business, and we got a ton of engagement. We... Um, we won a lot of business as a result and uh, and I exited that business, came out of that business a couple of years ago, came back here, started to do what I'm doing and um, it just felt one of the biggest challenges we have in our business, Jürgen, is educating people about what it is that we do and uh, uh, video has been a really good medium for us to tell the stories behind what we do, to share what it is that we do and and I've morphed with video over the course of the last six months or so, where the videos that I was creating 
six, 12 months ago where I would call them educational videos because that's what I needed to do. I needed to tell people what this thing called service design was, what customer experience was, what it meant, what were the tools, how did you do it, you know, the technical, practical stuff. Mm. And, and that, that's helped considerably and it's won us business. And, and where we've moved, um, I've really been intrigued with this whole concept of vlogging, video blogging. And, and it was actually the, the spur for this, I mentioned Marcus a short while ago, was a, a, a webinar that Chris Marr ran with Marcus at, at the start of the year. And Marcus didn't talk about content marketing that night and he didn't talk about world-class communication, he talked about video. And, and his belief that, that the businesses and organizations that use video to tell the stories of what they do, to document how they do. Oops, we've lost the audio. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Sounds hey. like you're back. Okay. Yeah. Um, Mark, so uh, I was on a webinar that Marcus Sheridan had spoken on a webinar for Chris Marr um, a couple of months ago, and that was the real stimulus for me to get back into creating video. And I decided to explore this vlog idea because it enabled me to tell more of the stories behind what I do rather than focus on the technical aspects of it. And that's been a lot of fun. And, and I think I'm editing at the moment uh, episode 11. So that's 11 weeks, I guess, nearly three months now of doing this. And um, again, that's been hugely beneficial for us in terms of new business, but also in terms of just helping people understand how you can use the tools that we use, but in a really we've brought it to life if you like mm. um it's almost like 3d versus 2d that's right the, yeah. other th and the other thing to be honest the other one of the other reasons i do this is i enjoy doing it yeah. i enjoy the creative process of filming stuff thinking how i'm going to edit it together what's the story i want to tell choosing the music um there's a whole just fun creative piece that I've, I've heard a few other people say that they, they film stuff and they get someone else to edit it well for me the editing is the most enjoyable part Mm. because that that lets me play and uh, I, I think that helps me to remain creative if, when I'm when I'm doing the editing and I'm choosing the yeah. music and I'm thinking about the scenes I want to shoot I'm getting up at 4 30 a.m. to go and do it to film a time lapse of the sunrise just because those eight seconds of video might work well in the next vlog mm. my wife thinks I'm crazy but it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. fun and life should be fun yeah yeah, I, I saw some of the ones you did, and I thought, oh, I need to, uh, I need to up my game a little bit because I've <laughs> I've been doing quite a bit of video stuff, but mm. I'm basically doing raw, unedited at the moment. So I've, I've yeah, okay. been getting in. I don't know if you've got Facebook Live Stream off your desktop yeah. yet. Um, so I'm doing a lot of that since that became available to me, and also I've got a system where I can do interviews with people on Facebook Live. So I'm starting to do a lot more of those but all of that's um facebook yeah. live is one of the things i know i know that chris and uh, i think marcus uses it chris uses it extensively i've mm. not really i've not hugely got into that um, i i one of the reasons is that when i'm um when i'm doing what i do i tend to be with clients during the daytime and um i can i can i can film that for the vlog uh, there's a, if you hear a little bit of noise in the background, there's a guy outside now blowing leaves with a huge <laughs> okay. machine. So apologies for that. Um, uh, so I've, just because of the timing and the way my day works, I've not really got into doing Facebook Live yet, but it's, mm. um, it, it looks like a really useful way to engage with your audience. Mm. Yeah, that certainly you can get some live engagement happening. Um, and yeah. I recently did a live uh, podcast episode with Facebook Live, which was ah. kind of fun and scaring, scary at the same time. <laughs> but it's, um, I guess it's what you mentioned earlier. It's, you know, um, getting out there and doing it and then iterating and improving on the system. Yeah. So I, I, I probably should do some video blogging with, you know, nicely edited videos as well. I think it comes back to... Oh, there's the blower. <laughs> yeah, he's just, he's a, I think hopefully that's him going away now. Yeah. Um, it comes back to understanding our audiences and, mm. and in what way do our audiences want to engage with us. If Facebook Live is the right medium, fantastic. 
for me, um, being able to record something, upload it to YouTube, that seems to be working well. And, then, and I, I'll continue to play with that for a while until something else comes along. And this time last year, we were all jumping onto Snapchat because I think yeah. <laughs> Vaynerchuk led the way on Snapchat. Chris Marr got into Snapchat. I got into Snapchat. I was speaking at an event last week with a guy who's become a good friend of mine now, Roger Edwards. And I met Roger through Snapchat. I'm doing business with someone in London that I met through Snapchat. So, you know, sometimes people will, who don't really get what we do will say to me, what are you doing Snapchat for? And then mm -hmm. I tell them about the business I've done with a guy in London or someone I've got to know through this, uh, in America as a result of being on this platform. Uh, and the one certainty is that if you don't go on it and you don't use it, you're never going to meet these people. So I tend to play with things when they first come out and figure out if it works for me or not. And mm. then I'll make a decision to go heavily into it or not. Yeah. Yeah, I, I tend to do the same. I tend to get involved in all of those things. So it's, it's finding a balance, though, isn't it, between yeah, you know, what's yeah. the latest shiny new toy and uh, focus on yeah. what's yeah, going to move lose, the needle. <laughs> yeah, you could lose your life. You could, I mean, you could you could lose evenings, mornings, weekends with if we if we you know used every piece of technology that was available mm. to us. So a little bit of playing to find out whether it works, yeah. and then figure that, then focus after. Focus. That. That's right. Um, so coming back to the content marketing aspect mm. and, and, you know, this sort of reminded me because of video, video story and that, um, I've started talking to people about information marketing and education marketing because you, you mentioned okay. earlier about education and so on. And I found that a lot of people that I'm talking to, clients and potential clients, um, talk about content, content for the website, content for their blog, content for, you know, their online digital marketing. And they kind of, it's almost like it's um, it's a red rag to a bull, you know. They, uh, well, not a red yeah. rag to a bull. They don't, it's not that they get angry about it. They get intimidated by it. And they are oh, content, I don't know. And, you know, I don't want to blog. I don't know what to write and so on. Yeah. And, and this idea of, well, really, it's answering your customers' questions before, you know, they ask mm -hmm. them. And it's mm -hmm. providing them information and it's educating them. So I've started talking in terms of information marketing and education marketing. And looking at the idea of, um, well, I started uh, a little while ago, I started interviewing people with, uh, to, in order to write content for them. Um, okay. yep. So asking them a whole lot of questions, interviewing them, recording the interview. So then I've got a whole lot of stuff that's in their voice and I just Fantastic. do a bit of editing. And so I thought, well, video would be a great way to actually do that and then use the video if you do it as a formal interview. Use that video yeah. in the yeah. way that you're doing video blogs, for example. Yeah, I think that's a, I love the terms, first of all, information and education marketing, because uh, this content is quite a generic term. And, mm. and as you say, some people become really quite confused by it. Um, what I found with video is I'm, so I'm going to visit somebody on Thursday um, to interview them. And, uh, and I'm not interviewing them with a specific, well, there are many specific purposes in mind, mostly for case study for me, for my, for my workshops and talks that I do. Mm -hmm. But I have, I, I have a thought to, to video some of the conversation with this, this uh, gentleman. What I found, though, when I speak to people and ask them if it's okay to, to film the conversation we're going to have, some people are really uncomfortable with that. Mm. Yeah. Either because... Either because what we're going to talk about might be sensitive, and that happened in a discussion I had in Aberdeen two weeks ago. So we, I filmed some of it, but didn't use the audio. Um, I, I, the audio was collected; it's in my head, and I would use it to tell stories. But I couldn't share the audio. Um, some people don't like how they look on on video, <laughs> um, and are really nervous about. It. And, and actually, sometimes putting a camera in front of someone makes them feel really yeah, nervous. Yeah. Uh, a lot. Some of the we do, we do a little bit of, um, well, I was going to say user research. It is user research. The technical term is ethno ethnographic research, and where we're, we're sitting interviewing people and listening to people, and we do film a lot of that because that's for research purposes as part of a project. And, um, and actually, a lot of the learning comes from the body language and looking at how people answer particular questions. So 
video, I think, is a huge can be a huge part of of all of our um, arsenal as we go forward. And and certainly, filming an interview with someone, filming a discussion that you might have with someone that that you can then share, uh, it's almost more engaging for people than just reading text mm. on a blog post. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I'm thinking. That you know, the it's more engaging, and it's yeah. probably. I think if if people don't have the issues around seeing themselves <laughs> on camera, or you know, if if the, I mean, if the information's sensitive, you wouldn't publish anyway. But yeah. if it's yeah. you know general information that they're prepared to, it's educational material for their clients, then presenting it on a video in an interview format might be a really good way to get somebody who might be reluctant to write something or do their own video might be Definitely. a good way to get it going. Yeah. Definitely. I'm, I'm running a workshop. I'm doing a lecture at the university on Friday and it's Friday afternoon. They've given me the graveyard slot just after lunch <laughs> with, with creative students, with design or art and design students and the subject is finance. Now, if you want to... <laughs> that that would be a challenging one, yeah. Yeah. So what we've done is we've crowdsourced the questions that they want to ask. And so we've got about 30 different questions that they've shared here over Twitter. And I've had a, a space where they can just write on a post-it note, put it on the wall. So I've collected those. What I've then done is I've gone out and I've interviewed design graduates who are now working in, in businesses for themselves as sole traders, as designers. And I've asked them the questions on video. And so what we're going to have on Friday afternoon it will be about as much fun as you can have in a finance lecture yeah. <laughs> because there are questions and it's not me that's going to be answering them. I'm just facilitating this thing, mm. but I'm actually using the people that are just two, three, four years ahead of them who are out making a living from the practice of design to tell them the answers to the questions they have. And I, when I was thinking, how do I do this? You know, I could stand up for an hour and talk at them about money. Well, I might end up with an empty lecture theater by the end of that. Whereas just as you've said, thinking about how we can use video and, and, and this is in a lecture theater, but even on a, an individual basis, more and more people are spending time watching video now on their smartphones. Mm. So I, that, maybe that's what that mother and father were doing yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Sure. But, but that's a, it's a fact. It's, it's how people are using technology. So if we can create video that helps people, I'm all for doing it. Mm. Yeah, well, that's that's a really innovative way to approach that Friday afternoon graveyard shift. Yeah, with a topic that <laughs> probably isn't all that appealing to design students. Yeah, well, hopefully it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, good luck. Yeah, it sounds it's like, like it could be fun. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, what's what's the one thing you'd like to improve in your own business, or that you know is challenge you finding really challenging? I think it's back to that word education, Jurgen. Um, we've come a long way in the last year and we've probably had several, we've had several iterations of our website and, and the language that we use to describe what we do. But, but if I walk in, if I still walk into a room full of business people and, and, and someone asks me what I do and if I, if I was to say it's about design, they think immediately that I'm going to talk to them about creating logos or building mm. a website or, you know, visual graphics of some format so there's still a huge education piece to do in the traditional business world of what this approach is and how it how and why it benefits an organization to think differently and that's a, that has been our biggest challenge over the last 12 months but when people get it then they love it and they, they immediately see the benefits and their businesses transform as a result we've got and so many different case studies that we can tell now but still, to, to get this, this concept of, of design thinking into the mainstream, then we just need to keep on working at education. And a large part of that is around the language that we use. So I try to steer clear of jargon. And I, I threw a jargon word in earlier. I talked about ethnographic research. Most people have no idea what that is. So I have to find ways of explaining what it is without saying that thing, if that makes sense. Mm. That, that's been our biggest challenge. And I, so I always have to check what I'm, try, what I'm about to say and really think of what I'm saying is, is clear, is simple, is making it easy for the user to understand that potential customer, prospect, whatever, business person, to understand what this is and why it would be a worthwhile thing for them to do. 
that's our biggest challenge. Mm. Yeah, I, I, you know, you said earlier about video that one of the biggest challenges is educating people about what you do, and I think you were talking about an earlier business. So it's it's, I think yeah. that's a general challenge that everybody faces, <laughs> although maybe not everyone recognises it. Yeah, I think you're probably you're probably right. And the idea of getting you know, falling into the trap of using a lot of jargon is actually symptomatic of providing a bad customer experience, isn't it? A hundred percent. Most yeah. of the research, when we research for our clients, what we do is we go talk to their customers. It's something most of them have never done. which is <laughs> but they, So they pay us to go talk to their customers for them. Yeah. And almost, not almost, every single time we do that, what comes back is jargon because mm. if you're the customer of an accountant, an accounting firm, then more often than not, you're not an accountant. So if they start speaking to you in accounting language, you don't mm. understand what they mean. We've had a similar experience with architects or with, uh, with lawyers or with any, we all have jargon in our industries, whatever it is that we do. And when we start to speak in that jargon, our customers don't understand us. So that's one thing that everyone could do to, be, to deliver a better service or experience to their customers is just ditch the jargon Mm. And it's actually a hard, it's a hard thing to do because you know what the jargon means, but, but you've got to think about it from the other person's perspective. It's having that empathy with the user and thinking, okay, well, that guy sitting across from me isn't an architect, so how do I explain this thing in a way that they'll understand? Yeah. And that, that then comes back to you know, telling a story, right? Or telling your yeah. story, and I know that, that Marcus. Yeah. I mean, we've mentioned Marcus a few times, but he's very big on storytelling and you know using stories to educate. It brings it to life. It's so much easier to you can relate to a story. Mm. Um, you can relate to a story much more so than you can relate to someone telling you a factual thing. It's why we moved away from doing factual blog uh, videos on YouTube. Yeah. I, I got bored. I was bored watching them, so I thought, Craigie, if I'm bored watching them, what's my, <laughs> my customer going to feel like? So yeah. Time to change that and tell stories instead. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, this has been fascinating. We could talk for a lot longer, and I know we haven't talked about cycling yet, and we haven't talked about mind mapping, but you know, I'm respectful of your time. So I think it's time that we moved on to the buzz, which is our innovation round, and it's designed to help our audience, who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. So I've got five questions and hopefully you'll give us something that will inspire people to go out and do something awesome. I will do my best. Great. So what's the number one thing you think anyone needs to do to be more innovative? I really think, I, I think it's about back to assumptions. Let's stop yeah. making assumptions. One fascinating piece of research that I've come across recently is to do with children, Jürgen. And up to the age of five years old, children are 98% of children have the capability to think divergently. That means that they can think creatively, they have a natural curiosity, they ask questions. And if anyone listening has children, they'll know the number one <laughs> yeah. thing kids under five do is ask why. why. Yeah. Yeah. By the age of five, the average child has asked 45,000 questions. The problem then is that they go to school and they become self-aware, but school, our school systems across the world reward success as opposed to inquiry. So over time, children stop putting their hands up and it's the teacher that asks the questions. And, and children stop putting their hands up to give the answer because sometimes they get the answer wrong and they mm. don't feel good about that. So they just gradually, that, that divergent thinking fades away. And by the age of 20, only 2% of children, young adults, by the age of 20 can think divergently. So that's a, if you think about that for a minute, 98% of people have the capacity, age five, to think divergently. By the age of 20, it's only 2%. Mm. But, but do you know what? We all have that within us. So that one thing I think that we can do that will make us all more innovative is get used to asking questions again. Think like a child. Be prepared to ask why. Don't be afraid to look... To look um, silly for asking a question yeah. we need to create we need to change that dynamic within our organizations so that we get back to being curious as individuals and curious as organizations it will stop us making assumptions yeah that's and we'll see the world in a different way that's great advice so in, insatiable curiosity is is something yeah. that i think that's that might be jargon but i mean i think it, it describes you know what you're saying asking oh, questions it. and 
Yeah, I mean, I I often, um, you know, the biggest breakthroughs I often have is if I see something and I think, oh, how does that work or why did that happen like that and, you know, dig into it a little more, just keep asking why, why, why. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And these days, I guess, I mean, I, I can't remember my reaction. I know I was very conscious when our kids were uh, in the Y age. They started very early, but... Um, I'm very conscious these days when I see it with kids and and have see parents reacting like oh leave me alone or something and I think oh no don't do that no encourage it yeah all right what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas um that's a really good question uh, so so the answer I think Jurgen would be to stop trying to do it on my own. Uh, and, and again, that's just how we've grown up in society. I remember an old boss of mine saying, don't bring me, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. And, and that was kind of the way of thinking back in the 90s, 80s and the 90s. However, what that does is that if you don't bring the problem and share it with others, then, then you don't get that collective um, capability that might solve the problem. We, we spend a lot of time challenging the, the problem in itself which might seem like a really long way to go around it, but is the problem the right problem? Mm. Is there an underlying problem that we should be solving? So my ethos is bring me problems, not solutions, and then let's work on it together. So let's understand it and let's collectively, if we really deeply understand it, then there's a much better chance that with different minds and different minds of uh, different types of people, different ages, different sex, different roles within organizations, much more diversity, I think that helps us to create better um, products, ideas, solutions. Yeah, and that's great advice. And I, you know, I probably um, have been, I don't know, conditioned or educated to take a stand of, yeah, I can fix this and mm. the bring me the solution kind of uh, approach. But I, I'm very conscious these days of, you know, go, go get help because the people that, have really succeeded and done something amazing. They've they've just been the front of something, and they've got a team together that yeah. actually gets things done. So they've got 100%. yeah yeah. All right. What's your favourite tool or system for improving productivity and allowing you to be more innovative? Uh, so there's, I guess, there's two answers to this. Um, in terms of being more innovative, I. I've mentioned design thinking a few times, and if mm -hmm. anyone's not familiar with the process of design thinking, the concept of design thinking, I'd encourage them to go and research that. Google it, have a look at my YouTube channel. But d design thinking really is a different way to approach idea generation and problem solving. In terms of productivity, then we use two or three apps in our business that help us to keep on top of what we're doing and keep on keep, um the process moving in the right direction and the, the favorite apps would be Trello um, and Slack. We use Slack constantly. Mm -hmm. um, and if Slack is a messaging tool, which means that in the old days we used to message by sending emails to each other. Yeah. And, and I just got really cumbersome and confusing. Slack enables us to have those conversations within, within, the, um, within the app of Slack and to be able to track things. And to, it's just a wonderful tool that has changed the way that we run our business, both with our clients, with the, Andy and myself in the business, and then with the people that support us. And it it's really made life better. And it's real time as well. Yeah, yeah. it is. It mm. is. And um, I've also taken recently to switching notifications off on my phone mm -hmm. because I found that <laughs> notifications were really interrupting my train of thought or my flow or my processes so i've there are a couple that i've left on but the majority of notifications are, are are switched off on my phone and my ipad so that as i'm sitting here talking to you my phone's on the desk but there's nothing happening with it whereas a month ago there would have been constant pings and mm. uh, that would have just it would have taken my concentration away from what i was doing mm. Yeah, we use uh, we use a tool called River, which is um, Slack, a Slack alternative. I used to use Slack, but we moved on to River. It's kind of does a whole lot more. Interesting. I'll take um, a look at that. Yeah, and but the beauty of that, so within our team, we virtually 
don't send emails anymore. So the only emails I get is when somebody shares a Google Doc with me. So yeah, Google yeah. sends me a notification of that. But even there, we've, um, for example, the uh, um, we have daily meetups using Zoom to, and we record those because sometimes we do some training in that. And the um, I've got it set up so that that's automatically posted to the River channel once mm. the recording's uploaded. So that's all automated. Excellent. So, yeah, you, it's great. really great to do those tools. Mm. All right, what's the best way to keep a client on track? I think... Uh, I think thinking back to projects we've run over the past year and a half or so, communication would have to be the answer, yeah. really proactive communication so that, that we're not, again, it's, it's about not assuming anything. We just make sure there's a regular flow of communication to and from the client so they know what's going on, we know what's going on. If there's a problem with anything, let's share it right away so that everyone's aware of it and we can collectively deal with it. Um, so if we're going to miss a deadline for a particular reason, let's share that straight away rather than get to the deadline and, and not meet it. Um, mm. So that I think communication, the other, the other word I use often is active listening. So when we're with clients, it's really about deeply listening to what it is that they're saying. And if we're not sure what they're asking or what they're thinking, then we, then we just encourage our people to ask. Let's just be really clear. That, that clarity around communication is, has been essential for us and it's enabled us because we've had a couple of bumps where we haven't perhaps done these things as well as we could have done. So we've made, we've made a point of, of changing that and just communicating everything. Hmm. That's, that's great advice. And I mean, I've found that, you know, if, if you let customers know, hey, you know, things have gone a little bit off the rails here, we're going to miss a deadline or something, let them know in advance. You know, yeah. Tell them what you're going to do moving forward that actually builds the relationship much stronger than, you know, and, and yet a lot of people feel as though, oh, it's a loss of face or something if I have to admit that I'm going to miss this deadline. And so they kind of pretend it's not happening. Yeah. Yeah, and then mm. they miss the deadline and they just right. upset the customer even more. So Exactly, yeah. yeah. So it comes back to the, <laughs> you know, what, what's the experience the customer's having? Exactly. Mm. All right, what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Another good question. These are, these, you're making me think, you're making me work <laughs> for it today. Um, <laughs> so this, is a, this will be an interesting one. It's back to something we talked about earlier today around around the customer expectation what makes a good and a bad experience these days what makes a good experience is doing what you've said you will do and if you just reflect on that for a moment or two mm. the harvard published some research recently and they'd studied 70,000 or so customer interactions and and what came out of that study was that 84 percent of customers expect businesses to let them down 84 percent yeah that's amazing yeah. isn't it yeah, which and that's just become the norm. So if we want to differentiate ourselves from our competition or from other people doing the same kind of job as us, if, if you do nothing else, then, then do what you've said you'll do and meet the expectations of your customer, client, boss, manager, whatever, then you're going to, be, you're going to stand out because you'll, you'll develop a reputation for being consistently good at what you do just by doing all the things you're supposed to because most people don't these days. Mm. You know, most people, if there's a little bit, if there's a half an hour of work left to do to finish a client project off at 5 p.m., but they're supposed to finish at 5 p.m., most people will go home at 5 yeah. and come back and finish it the next morning. And I'm not encouraging people to work overtime, but having that, just being conscious that, that thinking about things from the other person's perspective and maybe just going that extra mile, delivering what the customer, what you promised the customer you'll do, that's going to make a difference. Mm. Yeah, in some ways that's sad, isn't it? Because yeah, it really is. Yeah, but and and I sometimes reflect on this when I've had a good experience and I and I walk away from that experience and reflect on what it was and and then think that well, actually, that's what should happen. <laughs> and yeah. I think that's pretty sad that. I'm kind of, yeah. you know, I feel as though I had, I've had a really good experience when it's actually yeah. what should happen all the time. 
But it, that, that's where the opportunity lies for us. In it terms does, of being yeah. Within our businesses, if you realise that your competitors are going to think, they're not going to think like this. The majority mm. of people don't because 84% of customers now expect to be let down. So if you and your business make a point of every time doing things well, doing things properly, then you are going to stand out. Mm. That's very true, yeah. All right, so what, what's the future for you then and for... Um, Ashton McGill. Yeah. It's, um, it's an interesting one. You know, I worked two days a week. I worked two days a week at the University of Dundee until February of 2016. So I was three days a week on the business. But since February last year, since March last year, I've been five days a week on the business. So we're a year in now. And this, we make a, we've made a heck of a lot of progress in the last year. A lot of that's been about educating. And what, I'm see, what we're seeing now, three months into 2017, is we, we're really getting a lot of um, traction in the market now, Jürgen. We're getting a lot of inquiries. We're getting people contact us about projects that they wouldn't even have thought about 12 months ago. So, so 2017 is, is really interesting. It's about kind of leaning into that, um, enjoying that experience, continuing to educate, um, continuing to share these stories you know, hugely grateful to have the opportunity to, to speak to you and your listeners today. The more people that, that learn about this approach to business, then the bigger our market becomes. And, and it's a really exciting time to be doing this. It feels like this is my life's work. It's a culmination mm -hmm. of those 25 years of, you know, being an accountant and, and studying design and running customer centric businesses. And, and here we are now in 2017 with all of that experience come together. And we're also, it's, it's almost, it just feels like the right time uh, to be doing what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, that's great. All right, well, what's the number one piece of advice you'd give to any business owner that wants to be a leader in their field? I think the, the number one piece of advice would be that this takes hard work. Um, mm. And, you know, it's, I, I see some people, particularly younger people, think that, you know, they, that, they can just set up a business and entrepreneurship is this big shiny thing now. And, and it's great to be an entrepreneur and it means that, that you get flash cars and loft apartments and so on. <laughs> well, you know, maybe Please. you do, but that's probably the 1%. And th that 1% are the people that, you know, there's no such thing as an overnight success. It's rare to mm. find an overnight success. Usually behind an overnight success, there's 10 years of hard work and grind and pain and... And failure. And, and, Lots of failure. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and... And I, I think too many people don't realize or appreciate or understand that that's the case. This stuff's hard. And, mm. uh, and there are days where I want to bang my head off the wall. There are days where I, it's incredibly frustrating, but they're balanced out equally by the fun days, by the days where you, know, you win a new project, by the days where, you, for me, I help somebody, an organization to, to make a breakthrough for them to help their customers. But none of that is possible if, if you don't put the put the hard graft in and um you know i'm not again i'm not i'm not advocating us doing 16 18 hour days gary vaynerchuk style but actually just put the work in and uh, that's what gives you the experience the expertise that that you can then use to go out and make a difference mm. yeah that's great and i think you know you touched on a couple of things there i think the the idea of you know the suave um, <laughs> guy standing in front of a expensive car and with a yacht in the background and the glamorous model atop <laughs> the car or something <laughs> that, that that's a bit yeah. of a fallacy um, but yeah. i think that you know in some ways and maybe maybe we're getting over that now but in some ways back in the internet bubble days people thought well you can start a business easily on the internet and you'll have this overnight success without putting in that hard work but I think it's coming back now to to the point where people realize that you do have to you do have to put in the work you do have to get people involved get people's help you do have to think about the customers which is kind of the message yeah. that's coming through today yeah I think and I think that the other thing is that that in terms of leadership and being a leader you don't choose to be a leader the, the market chooses you Mm. And, and you only get to that point when you've done the hard stuff, when you've got the track record, when you, when you, you, know, you do these things well, you do them honestly, with integrity, with authenticity, then the market will recognize you as a leader. You can't just get up tomorrow and decide to be a leader. 
Yeah. Okay. Now, um, I noticed uh, your one but last blog was um, referencing Casey Neistat's um, video, Do What You Can't, which kind of speaks to this a little bit, doesn't it? Because it, it, um, it takes the approach of, you know, go out and mm. just have a go at something rather than, yeah. you know, fit in with somebody else's expectation. Definitely. Casey's been a huge inspiration to me the last six months or so. And um, there's so much of, of um, society tells us that we can't do things, we shouldn't do things, that mm. it's not possible, that, that, you know, that that job's not for you. Well, well who's to say that? And it's, it's, we all have the capability, we all have within us, you know, 98% of us had the capability to think divergently when we were five years old. Mm. And, and the system and education and so on can change, can knock that out of us. But actually, we all have the capability to do amazing things. And you know, when Casey shared that video last week, a couple of weeks ago, I think I must have watched that a dozen times now, Jürgen. It just, if I want a bit of motivation and inspiration, that's a, that's a great video to watch. Mm. And we live in this amazing age now where, yeah, we've got all of the technology. The world is smaller than it's ever been. We can reach more people than we've ever been able to. That, that, I'm more excited about that now than I've ever been, and I'm 48. And I'm actually more excited about the next 10 years and what's possible than I was 10 years ago. And, and I hope I will be in another 10 years' time again. Hmm. All right. Well, this has been really fantastic, Ali. I've really enjoyed this. And like I say, we, we could probably keep talking for ages because we <laughs> haven't even touched on cycling or mind mapping or some yeah. other things related to, <laughs> to the work you do. But um, I, I think it's, you know, I think we'll revisit that later perhaps. Yeah, so sure. where can people reach out to you and say thank you? The, um, the best way to connect is probably Twitter is the medium that I'm, I'm most um, uh, available on. My, you'll find me on Twitter at, um, at Ali, A-L-I underscore McGill, M-C-G-I-L-L. -L. People are more than welcome to email me. I'd love to hear from anyone. The best email address is Ali at AshtonMcGill.com. And then I'm on Instagram at Ali underscore McGill and my YouTube channel, um, which is Alistair McGill. You'll find that if you Google uh, or search on YouTube. Uh, okay. So any one of those you're going to, I'd love to, I'd be delighted to hear from anybody. Great. Thanks. And we'll, and we'll post uh, links on the blog corresponding to the podcast to all those, uh, those resources. So finally then, Ali, who would you like me to interview on a future and overbus podcast and why? There's a gentleman by the name of Ian Altman. I don't know if you've heard of Ian. Um, oh, we've had Ian. We've had Ian on the podcast, on? but happy to have him again. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was looking back through and I never spotted Ian's name. Let me suggest somebody else. There's a, a gentleman um, that I've got to know through Chris Mars community, through the Content Marketing Academy, whose name is Kevin Anderson. And Kev is a storytelling coach. And we've talked a lot about storytelling today. And I've worked with Kevin over the past six or eight months. And Kev has helped me to craft my, or to hone my craft of storytelling, both in terms of um, in the written form, in audio form, and on video. And he has a real talent for that. And he's doing some really interesting stuff in and around storytelling and exploring how not just businesses, Kev is working with all, all types of organizations and individuals, but how we can use storytelling to engage with audiences and to get our messages across. And I think mm. Kev would be an really interesting guy for you to talk to. Oh, that sounds fascinating. Yeah. So Kevin, uh, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Ali McGill. And, and we might go and see what Ian's up to as well and perhaps talk <laughs> to him again. Um, Cause you've, you've kind of prompted in my mind. I mean, we've, we've been talking about, um, not getting onto a lot of topics and perhaps revisiting those, I, I should go back and and follow up and see what people are up to because things change as as people yeah. move forward. And it has been a while since we had Ian on, so I might uh, go and see what he's up to and perhaps have a chat to him about a specific topic next time. Great stuff, Jürgen.
All right. Well, thanks so much for sharing your time and your insights with us today on the Innova Buzz podcast. I've really enjoyed it and had a great time learning all about what you do and, and your approach. And I like the idea of you know, system design and, and design as a, a concept for the customer experience and for products or services based on that. And it's consistent with kind of how we approach things in terms of starting off with understanding your client and what they need and how your own services or product might be a fit for that. So I wish you all the best for the future at Ashton McGill and all the other stuff you've got going on. And let's keep in touch. Thanks, Jürgen. It's been an absolute pleasure and I've thoroughly enjoyed my time with you today. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers. That was another fantastic interview and I'm so honoured to have had Ali on my podcast. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did and also learned from Ali's experience. All the great ideas and tips that Ali shared with us can be found at innovabiz.com.au forward slash Ashton McGill. That is A-S-H-T-O-N-M-C-G-I-L-L. All lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.com.au forward slash Ashton McGill. We'd love you to leave comments underneath that post to tell us what you got out of this episode and what actions you'll take as a result. Ali suggested I interview Kevin Anderson, a storytelling coach that he's worked with on a future Innova Buzz podcast. So Kevin, I'm really looking forward to this interview. I love storytelling and keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from me to the Innova Buzz podcast courtesy of Ali McGill from Ashton McGill. Ali also mentioned Ian Altman, who we've previously had on the podcast in episode 39 which is some time ago. So Ian, we might invite you back to talk some more about designing a fabulous customer and user experience. I want to conclude with a thank you to my audience. I know that many of you are regular listeners and I appreciate the feedback you're providing. If you're a first time listener and you like this podcast, then go and subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher or Pocket Casts, whatever your favourite way of consuming podcasts is so that you'll never miss a future episode. While you're there, of course, we'd love you to leave us a review just to let us know how we're doing. If there's anything you'd like us to cover or questions you want answered on a future Innova Buzz podcast, please send them to us. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from Innova Biz. And remember, if you don't innovate, you stagnate. So think big, be adventurous, and keep innovating.